So we have just broken up this teaching into three teachings because the Lord asked for that. thought we were going to be done with this one last week, but it was just a little too much. The Spirit of God was so strong with that teaching. I know that a lot of you were transformed. Something happened. A transformation began to happen. And we had to take this teaching just a little slower. So I hope tonight we can finish off this teaching before we go into our next teaching. And I'm excited for what he's doing. Because he's doing some awesome things. He's doing some awesome things. You know, we're on the verge of opening an education center, a training center. And that is so that the word of the Lord can go out by those who are being instructed, those who are of like-mindedness, not to us, but to Him. To Him. He is jealous for you. The Word of God tells us, oh, He is jealous for you. And He wants His ways to be expressed upon the earth. But how do we do that if we do not have the rightly divided Word of Truth? Many people think that the word of truth is simply Yeshua come down, given his life, resurrected, given us the grace that we need, and then we are able to befriend Yeshua. Yeshua becomes our friend, and we escape the judgment of God. But see, that's not the truth. That's not what the word of truth shows. That's just a few scriptures that show that he's graceful God. He's a wonderful God, a loving God. And the more we get to know who He is and the character of who He is and the attributes and how He wants us to be like Him, if this transformation doesn't happen in you, then you will be separated from Him, as He has said. This time in your life is simply a time of almost retrospection, an inspection, a looking around to see how to live in eternity with a God whose similitude you become. Similitude, impression. You are the impression or the image of God. Has anybody ever crafted a mold and poured something into the mold, whether it be chocolate, whether it be a ceramic, whether it be candy? You didn't expect it to remain the same, but you meant for it to become a new vessel. And that's what God is looking for in you. That's what He's looking for in us. We can't read these scriptures without an intended purpose. That's what He's looking. He doesn't want you the same. He wants a new vessel. He wants there to be a crying out, God, take me. Break me into a million pieces. See, the day that I said that, it wasn't the first day of my, you know, when I became saved, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that. It was later in life when I found that he said, I can't use you unless you become a new vessel which I can use. The old man is past. Yes. But now we must look into the pouring into of God. That pouring out of him and into you requires a new vessel. One that can handle the glory of God. I've seen people under the anointing who scream out, stop. Because when the power of, true power of God comes for transformation, it hurts. I remember, I could tell you a story, my husband and I, and I told this story to someone here the other day. We were in bed and we were moving to another level of anointing. We, we used to uh, have our noses in every book and video and CD and anything we get our hands on. TV was the last thing we were going to watch. When we, were, when we were newlyweds, it wasn't about me looking at him and him looking at me, as amazing as that might sound. <laughs> it was about, we would sit for hours and play tape after tape, people lending us things, people, we just, we wanted all, we wanted it all. When we became uh, one, the Lord had to become one in us, with us, for our ministry, for our calling, 
And then he had to be one with us individually. You see? So with this, we were so wrapped up in, in wanting all that he had that one night we were in bed and, and we were asleep. And we happened to wake up at the same time. And I was turned looking at him and he was looking at me and we thought, well, how strange. We just woke up and start staring at each other. When the presence of God came in the room. And we both knew the presence of God was coming down this way. When, it be, when, the, when the anointing of the Holy Spirit came, started to come down, I kid you not, before the end of us crying out for Him to stop, our mattress was being pushed in. Our bodies were being pushed into the mattress. I kid you not, my husband was there. He's the other witness. And the Holy Spirit is the other witness. <laughs> and, and the presence of God just began to push us down. And at first it was, oh, the Holy Spirit, right? Where is it? And our tears. And then when Sam starts crying, you know it's hurting because, you know, that power starts to pop. And we were looking at each other like, Ooh! that's what you heard in our bedroom. Ooh! We began to weep and cry and ask them to stop. And then when he began to lift up, again, that presence was so sweet. And we sat down and we looked at each other and said, what was that? What was that? We knew it was the presence of God. We were familiar with the presence of God. But after that, visions, dreams, and manifestations like we couldn't imagine started to happen unimaginable things began to happen in our lives and that's when he sent us away from where we were comfortable and he said you got seven years See, he gave us seven years you got seven years before I transform you again what is this and so I feel led that you should understand that there's different realms different levels different Things that God does to prepare you and to propel you. Prepare you and propel you. And if you haven't been propelled yet, some of you are just about on that verge. And it's not going to be what you think because it's not what we thought. It's not what we thought. But I am eternally grateful that He gives me the opportunity to prepare some of you. I'm eternally grateful because he's so jealous for you. He's allowed me to touch you and simply just that because you're all his. And I love that. He shares you with no one. How can you share yourself with anyone if he shares you with no one? If you don't feel love just because of that statement, <laughs> oh, I'm going to pray over you. <laughs> Let's begin in chapter 3 of John where we left off a couple weeks ago. And we, were, we went into chapter 3 and we were talking about the new birth. If you remember, most of you said, uh-oh, I may not be born again. And so I wanted to just go into understanding the new birth because in the new birth we learned that it wasn't just about I receive Yeshua and now I'm saved and now I'm born again. The rebirth is a process. We talked about the process of being birthed. That it was not simply that easy. Some of you uh, will understand better how your calling works when you understand this new birth. Because if you don't understand this new birth, then you're not going to understand the purpose behind the new being that you are. And most of us, because we were born in the flesh first, okay, all of us born in the flesh first, we tend to look at the flesh desires and the flesh way and try to make understandings based on our spiritual life. So what we're actually doing is we're just taking the spiritual life like I would this highlighter and I'm opening it up and I'm saying, okay, now this is my spiritual life in my hand. What do I do with it? But you can't attach that which is spiritual to the flesh. It's not possible. You can't just take it in your hand and say exactly what I've been formed to do. I've been doing it. All I've got to do is take spiritual and mark a little bit. Because my flesh is going to walk in the spirit. Now we're going to see how it doesn't work that way. Many of you, your talent. How many, how many know that I have great talent to sing? How many here can say, Jamie, you have great talent to sing? I'm not gloating, right? I'm not standing here gloating. I'm not saying that. 
And how many of you understand that that's not my calling? Do you see that? So why am I not one of the top people in Christian artistry right now? Does it make sense? Is this a good, is this a good evaluation of who I am? I always knew I was never going to be a singer. I knew there was something more. I called it earthly knowledge. Because <laughs> I love knowledge. And when the Lord transformed me, He even took that away from me. And He said, I never called you to earthly knowledge. I called you to spiritual knowledge. And one day, I was uh, 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, before I had Andrew, I was at home and I was desiring to do exactly that which the Lord had called me to do. And He began to rapidly, with repentance and obedience, woo, He rapidly changes your life. Those two words, you don't know any other two words, but repentance and obedience will change your life. Those two words. And so I went into a, a sleep during the day. A lot of you already know me. I don't like to sleep during the day. It makes, messes up my system. And my children went to school, and I didn't have Andrew yet, and I had all three little ones in school. And I fell asleep on the sofa, and I said, oh, I've got a few minutes. And I had a dream. And in this dream, I, 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 I ended up understanding the revelation of the dream, not to get into the dream, was I birthed a little baby girl in my dream. And this little baby girl, so precious, I loved her so much, and yet the world was trying to take her away from me and adopt her out to somebody else. And in this dream, I remember going and taking this baby girl, and they gave her back to me and said, we're so sorry, we thought you were going to adopt her out. And I said, why would I do that to my own children? I have three children. Why would I adopt the fourth one out? And when I unwrapped this little girl, she was the most beautiful baby I'd ever seen in my life. Pink and warm and just, and she was completely wrapped in this pink furry blanket. And when I opened this blanket and I looked at her, I said, oh, when I breathed in her essence, I felt her essence come into me. And a light from heaven opened up and he said, call her name Wisdom. When I birthed Wisdom that day, this word of God became so easy to read. So much like the law books that I loved. This, this Bible became my law. And I was amazed at the revelations he began to show. And he said, call her name Wisdom. See, Wisdom is birthed. It's not handed to you easily. It is birthed. You have to go through a transformation of repentance and obedience to birth wisdom. <coughs> Have you ever asked for wisdom? <coughs> Have you truly said, I need wisdom in my life? And then thought with your head? Because wisdom is birthed with the Spirit here. I've always told people, wisdom is here. Wisdom is not here. You don't need this earthly mind for wisdom. One day when my nephew came to me, he said, I'm, I'm not good at schooling. And I shared that with him. <coughs> wisdom isn't here. Wisdom's not here. Wisdom is born of the spirit, not of the mind. Not of the mind. And we went on this fast together for wisdom, he and I. I took him in my hands. I said, we're going to, and it was hard. And we went through and then the fast was over and I, I looked at him and, and he looked at me like, no, there's nothing here. Just a little bit thinner, you know, in the, in the pants. But little by little he began to see how wisdom works. And he looked at me and some of these things that come out of his mouth according to what he sees in the Word of God prove you don't need your mind. You need the mind of the Spirit. You need the mind of the Spirit, not yours. And so when we're reading John chapter 3, I want you to read Yeshua's words by asking the Spirit, Spirit of God, right now anoint me with wisdom. Anoint me right now with wisdom to see what Yeshua is saying to me. See the Word of God with the mind of the Spirit. 
see it with the mind of the spirit, not your own. I don't use my mind. If I used my mind, I'd mess it up. I use his. And we're gonna, we're gonna, let's talk about that as we go along. All right, I think that's where the Holy Spirit has us today. We know the verses now. Chapter 3 says, was a man, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night, to Yeshua by night, and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now remember, we went through this in the last teaching and we talked about what it was to be born again. We talked about being able to see meant that you no longer were able to see in the flesh, but you'd exchange the flesh realm in your born again experience to the spirit realm. The flesh realm sees what it wants. The flesh realm is attached to nefesh, the soul. The flesh realm can destroy what you see if you don't look with eyes in the spirit. It transforms in front of you to the desires of your flesh, that which you see in the flesh. That which you see in the spirit cannot transform to the lust of the flesh. It can't. He says, in order to see the kingdom that you want to live in, you have to be rebirthed. You have to be rebirthed. And so we went and we said, what is this rebirth experience? I took four major words. The word born, the word offspring, the word yalad or child, and the word begotten. And we saw that uh, ha hashav was to be conceived. And you know this, if you've ever had a child, seen a child being born, somebody being pregnant, you know that when you first see a woman, you don't see the baby. It's inside the woman. They come to you, they have no form, no belly. Well, some of us have a belly and we're not pregnant, just want to let you know. But they have no belly and they stand there and they say, we're pregnant. And you look at the man like, she's pregnant. You're not pregnant. And the man goes, we're pregnant, you know? And they're so happy, but there's no, there's no form there. You can't see anything. That's conception. Conception is hidden. It's secret. It's holy. It's secret. It's holy. It's something that you, you can't see with your eyes. Today, we have these great scientific methods to go and see how the sperm and the egg get together and they manifest and create this embryo, they call it. But in the mind of God, it's a holy thing. It's an intimate act between two people that create together to form a new vessel. See, between your flesh self and God's self, there's an intimacy that is going to create the new vessel. That's why you're made of earth. This, God didn't make a mistake. And neither did he repent. But he mourned the day that Adam lost intimacy with him. He mourned that day. He said, Adam, all I wanted to do was create a new vessel out of you. That's all I wanted to do. You didn't give me time. You didn't give me any time. It takes time. When my husband and I first got married, we had our, our first pregnancy, and, and that one ended pretty tragically for us. And then there was this four-year period of nothing. Nothing. A four-year period of doctors saying, just don't try and don't do it. I have five children today. I wish I could take them to that doctor. And stand him before the doctor and say, here's the don't try, here's the don't do it, here's the mistake, here's the curse, here's the this. Here they are. And God be magnified. 
Amen. God be magnified. Because those four years were devastating. Because who would think Abraham in his 90s would say, I have no child. I have no inheritor. It's the same as the four years. Felt like 90 years. And then we got to this point where here we go again. Let's try again. And there's another one. Ends in disaster. And we think, and this time they said, are you kidding me? We warned you once. We're warning you again. And then God snuck in intimacy one more time and conceived my son. And he said, when man says no, he says, it's just my opportunity to say yes. It's my opportunity to do what I know how to do best. But I had to learn intimacy with God. So that when that child came forth, I could teach him intimacy with God. Something Adam couldn't do. Adam forfeited the intimacy with God. So he couldn't create a new vessel out of Adam. If you realize when Seth was born, well, let's realize when first when Cain and Abel were born, the split personality came out of Adam and Eve. He had a chance with Abel. Abel wanted to be intimate with God. And he knew that the perfect sacrifice was the lamb. And he offered the perfect unblemished lamb. But what did the other offer, Cain? He says, I'll give him the best of my crop. But you see, it was Cain's crop. He didn't see how God's intimacy was by the shedding of blood. Just as it is with a man and a woman. That's a blood covenant we have with each other. God says, my intimacy comes with a shedding of blood. I'm that intimate. I want that much intimacy with you. That I'll give my blood for you. That's how intimate I am. That's how much you have to recognize I want you to myself. He did it with Noah. He only found righteousness in one. That he can't do it with you? Just one. He didn't need everybody. He just needed one. I want you to have that in your, in your spirit. When you think about this all-knowing, intimate creator. Who foreplanned it all. Who you live it in your re respect, respected lives today. As man and wife. You live the same intimacy. You desire those who aren't married, desire the same intimacy with a woman or a man that he desires with you. You are formed and fashioned after his likeness. And he's looking and he's searching so that in this intimacy he can make a new vessel out of you. This is not about conceiving a ministry. This is about reconceiving you. You. Who he wants to tear to a million pieces and rebuild again. As he told the prophet uh, Jeremiah. He wants to see the wonderful you. That he had fashioned in his mind from the beginning. Isn't that something? Wow. If you don't feel loved already. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Can he? Nicodemus was seen with fleshly eyes, with eyes of the flesh. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter in. So first we see the scene. First, he can't see the kingdom without being born again. And without being birth of water, right, and the spirit, you cannot, what? Enter. So there's, there's two differences there. There's a difference in both sense. The first, your sight is cut off. And second, you are cut off. This tells me that we're going to have an opportunity to see the kingdom of God when we touch Salvation. Many people at salvation can see the kingdom, 
But it doesn't mean that they can experience the kingdom. Let's see that again. He says, unless you, he, if one is born again, he can't see the kingdom. He can't see it, right? See it. Secondly, unless he's born of water and the spirit, he can't enter. And this is something that we need to really understand. We need to really understand entering in. All right, so let's go with number one to see. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now these two words, if you look at them in the Greek and the Hebrew, you're going to have variances, the way we notice. We've noticed how the variances happen with the wording. And we want to make sure and we want to get the solid description of what this word see is. And the word to see in Greek is horeo. It's a verb. It's an action, right? To see with eyes or perceive with the mind or mechanical perception. It's some, that's a something that, this is something that we're talking about. In order for you to see it, if I say, uh, William, can you see this, these letters? No, right? You're too far. But if I say, William, can you see these colors? Yes. All right. So he has mechanical perception to discern what he can see and what he cannot. Although he can see it's a Bible, he can't see from way over there that these letters, these letters are too small. Now some of you, I understand you have eagle eyes, but you know, give them back. You're human. <laughs> okay? But yet he can perceive with mechanical perception. So is this really the word we need to use? Is this really the word that he's saying? If he were really using this word in this text to say to literally see the kingdom mechanically by per perceiving it, then he would have told Nicodemus when he said, can a man be put into his mother's womb and born again? He would have said, yes, he can, because that's natural. Correct? Yes. But let's see the Hebrew, hazah, which comes from the word hazak, or comes from the word uh, hason. The word comes together, and it's a verb also. And it's to contemplate anticipate, expect, consider, or behold. Now if I to give you the word behold, what do you immediately think? Something that you can actually attain. The kingdom of God is not about seeing or experiencing with the flesh. The kingdom of God is to behold. If we go to the book of Revelation, we end up Beholding the kingdom of God, entering into an eternal place where it will never end. And we will live with the Lord forever. When we hear the words to live with the Lord forever, then we can ascertain that chaza is the verb that must be used there because we will behold the kingdom, which means it's livable now. Didn't he tell John? When his disciples went and John was in prison, see, strenuous times, storms in your life cause you to question God. They cause you to question God. I want you to understand something. Although John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, when he got to the place of incarceration for the name of Yeshua, because that's what he was declaring, he got weak. He sent his disciples and what did he ask? Do you remember what he asked? Are you the Messiah? After he was proclaiming that he was the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. Well, are you the Messiah? Did he not know the Messiah would take away the sin of the world? Maybe he didn't. There's people today who don't believe that. There's teaching today that do not believe that Messiah came to take away the sin of the world. So if we are looking at this with fleshly eyes, then we are looking at this by saying, is this the Messiah? How can we be sure? But he said, tell him what? What did he say? The blind see, right? Right? 
the lame walk. Miracle signs and wonders are happening, John. And when these things happen, the kingdom of God has arrived. He didn't say the kingdom of God is to arrive. He said the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has arrived. It is at hand. If I go to a king in a big palace like Camelot and I go going on my horse and the enemy is chasing me and I say, Hail King! The war is at hand. Am I saying what about the war? That it's what? It's here. It's here. It's at your door. It's time to get up. That's the only way I know. I love those kind of movies with the whole kings and the bearing. Medieval. Medieval, there you go. I love them. I like the way they talk. Everyone is British. <laughs> Even though some spoke French and Spanish and other things, everyone is British. <laughs> Maybe it's because they are, you know, the kingdom, you know, the queen and all. But this is, what, this is what he told John. He says that when you see these signs, it's time to oh, put down the drawbridge. I'm here. The kingdom has arrived. It, are these signs and wonders still with us? Then is the kingdom of God here? And so this is what we have to understand. <coughs> this verb meant to behold what was. Not to see it with your eyes. Not to be a spectator, but a participator. And that's what this new birth experience gives you. It gives you a pass, an entrance into a kingdom. It's like those, I don't know why movies are coming up in my head, which I haven't seen, but it's like those movies that you get teleported because there's an imaginary wall and all of a sudden you're in another world. But yet... You're not of the same world. But in God's kingdom, you are in the same world. And that experience comes to manifest into the same world that you're in. So you don't get to escape into the other world and then come back and it's all the same. When it's the kingdom. It is meant to enter into the world. The kingdom's not for you to escape the world. It is meant to enter the world. Through who? Through you. The kingdom of God wants to manifest through you. And the only way is to be born again. Of water and the spirit. So let's go. Let's see what the water and the spirit is. I'm excited. Born of water and the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can, this, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Can he? No. Yeshua said, I say to you, I tell you the truth. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now let's remember that God purposely led Moses and the Israelites to the bank of water. He did not lead them around the water, which he could have. He led them directly to the water. He had them stand directly, and we've gone over this with all these teachings, directly at the foot of the water. If they would have obeyed, they would have jumped in. But they hesitated. God didn't make a mistake. He didn't make a mistake by leading them to the water. He knew they had to be cleansed. And there is a purpose for the washing of the body. Do you remember what we said it was? That washing of the body. We went to Ezekiel 36. We went to Ezekiel 36. And we read a spectacular verse that the work of John and Ezekiel 36 said verse 22 said 
Say to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord, it is not for your sake, is it not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you were sent, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. Why do you need the washing of the water? Which has been profaned among which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned and in their midst. Then the nation will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When I prove myself holy among you in their sight, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands and bring you into our own land, your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your filthiness and from all your idols. The revelation of the baptism in water is not the submersion in the water. It is the revelation that his name has been profaned by you. That his name returns and you cast every imaginable thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Everything. What is the first commandment? And you shall love the Lord your God with your heart and and your soul. The nefesh. How do you love God with your nefesh? How do you love God with your intellect, your soul, your emotions, your passions? How? How is it possible? How is it possible? This is what we're talking about. He said, when I take you through the waters, and you know what? They did not walk through the waters. They walked according to the land that was all bare. There was not any water there. It, it rose up to let them by. But Hebrews tells us something else. Can we go to Hebrews 10? Hebrews, Hebrews, to the Hebrews. And I'm telling you, my Bible, I should have never put tabs because I could find verses quicker without tabs. It says, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things can never by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continu continually, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin. Now listen to this. There is sin consciousness. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. There is sin consciousness. He says what the law was doing could not take the consciousness of sin away. Consciousness of sin was there because the, the limited abilities that we allow the law to work in us. That's what it's saying. The limited ability of what the law works in us causes us to remain in consciousness of sin. Now let me explain that to you. If you're, if you're not understanding me correctly, I want everyone to remember the day they took their test for their driver's license. How many got a perfect 100? Nobody. Why? Because that which we don't have to worry about, we get by with. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many of you saw some questions in there that you thought a trucker should need and not you? Yeah, right? Yeah. You're like, are you kidding? I'm not driving a semi. What are they asking this question for? <laughs> I just need to get my driver's license to go down the street to the corner store. And when they gave you a passing grade and said, hey, you could miss six and you only missed five, you went, yes! And that one little law there that you didn't know, you probably still don't know. That's what the law did. It couldn't take away the consciousness of sin. There, there remained sin consciousness because the law that you ignored 
Not that it wasn't perfect. For the word of God in Psalms says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Not that it wasn't perfect. It was that you are imperfect. So let's not get sin consciousness mixed up, you know, to the point where you say we have no sin consciousness. If you're sinning, you're sinning. And I tell you to repent. Mm -hmm. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder. All right. So now we're dealing with the sacrifices according to the law. Remember the reminder? Bring me a heifer. Bring me a cow if you do this sin. Can you imagine in the camp carrying the cow all the way to the door? Oh, it was going to remind you you were a sinner, wasn't it? And the whole camp was going to know you were a sinner. Imagine carrying the goat. Yeah, hide the goat behind you. All the way to the door, just so God can cleanse you from that sin. You know, sometimes I wish it never ended. Some of you need a cow and a goat. <laughs> Honestly. I need sometimes a cow and a goat. You know, I'm not lying. Yeah, it's wonderful when you have to sacrifice the lamb, right? Wonderful. But what about that cow and that goat? Boy, it was a reminder that you had sinned. You imagine a woman in her time of impurity? She had to carry those doves with her? I was like, oh, I thought so. I thought she was at the time of her impurity. Now look, she's got to take these doves. These pigeons or whatever they were, lovebirds, I don't even know, I don't remember quite well. But I want you to understand. I want you to understand. It was a reminder. I thank God that we don't have to be sacrificing these beautiful animals today. I thank God. But now what do we do, right? But now what do we do? Is there another type? It says, there were, uh, is, uh, uh, sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Why? Because sin lives inside of you, not them. They just covered God's eyes for a moment. Is that what Yeshua is doing for you? You're allowing him to cover your sin for a moment until you sin again? Huh? It says, therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast taken no pleasure. No pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come in the role of the book. It is written of me prophetically to do your will. O God. After saying above. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings, sacrifices for sin thou hast not desired, nor hast thou taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. He takes away the first to establish the second. What is he talking about? He's saying, you've taken for granted the measures I have offered you for sin, against sin consciousness. You decided that you would take sin consciousness the whole year and bring me an offering so I could look away every year. That's what he said. You've decided to walk in the lust of your flesh. Now I have to figure out a way or I have to give you part two. <laughs> I got to give you part two because part one didn't work. Is, is that what we're still doing today? How horrible that we're now leaving the blood of goats and cows and all these other sacrifices. And now we're using the blood of Yeshua the same manner. We're saying... I can go sin and come and repent so that you look away, I use his blood. Is that truly a baptism? Is, has God given us a rebirth? No, we're still in the first stage where someone sought us, we loved it, we gave ourselves away for a moment, and now we're playing hard to get. 
As one person once said to me when I said, why aren't you married? They said, well, I've got to test drive the car first. Now imagine. Are you test driving Yeshua? Because there is a limited amount of grace. By this will we have been sacrificed, uh, sanctified, I'm sorry. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the blood of Yeshua Messiah once for all. So the offering that he's giving us is that once and for all we accept atonement realizing that now sin become behind us, sin becomes something we don't look forward to doing, to manipulating the blood of Yeshua. But now we say, I accept the blood so that he helped me not sin again. He helped me not sin again. So we have a sin consciousness now that is reversed. First, the sin consciousness was that we were sinners. We like to be sinners. And we use the blood of sacrifices to remiss us of sin. But now sin consciousness takes another form and we say, wash me in your blood. And if I sin, convict me of sin. But who brings conviction? The Holy Spirit. Do you see how much you need the Holy Spirit? Because how would you know it's sin against God lest the Holy Spirit reveal it? Lest He reveal it. There are si secret sins. There are sins that are not identifiable as me taking this and sticking it in my pocket. This is pretty easy to identify as sin. But what about the sin of the heart? What about when Yeshua said, in your law it is said that if you commit adultery with another woman, then you break the law, correct? But I say to you that if you even look upon her with lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. Who convicts you of that sin? Only the Holy Ghost. So I have to ask you, if you are born again, why would you keep on sinning? This is very important. And the Holy Spirit led us to this because He wants you to be washed in His blood. See, the water was identifying, when you went into the waters, you're identifying, pro placing the name of Yehovah upon your body, upon you. If you represent Yehovah, how can you sin? If He is holy and sinless, how? Amen. The seal of His name upon you and the ridding of idolatry where He is Echad and God alone in your life is the baptism of water. The cloud led them, and they walked through the cloud, the Word of God says. They were walking through Him. See, even every Israelite was baptized in water. And they must have remembered that when John shows up and says, Come to the waters of baptism. And what is he saying? We, we went through the whole text of what John was saying. He was saying, your life is temporary. All things are vanity. But I know one who sustains you forever. He was evangelizing. He wasn't just saying, come, dunk yourself in water. I got to do this for the remission of sins. Come, dunk yourself in water. We got to do this for remission of sins. He was not doing that. He wasn't even saying, come and be immersed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Had not been given that mandate would had not been given. We do all these things to think that we're entering into His fullness and we're actually entering into religion. And He says, I'm not part of religion. I'm part of relationship. Religion, pure religion, the Word of God describes it, is something that comes from the heart. We are told what pure religion is. And we had, we had all of Israel passing through this cloud. And we had all of Israel proclaiming that Yehovah was their God. And so this is the first step of the water. The second step, Matthew 3.13. Matthew 3.13. 
I'm telling you, I should have just never tabbed my Bible. I'm having a hard time with it. <laughs> Matthew 3.13 Yeshua says to John, and I'm in 13. Yeshua says, Yeshua says, I'm sorry, Yeshua says in Matthew 3 13, I've got to fix this slide. Yes, he, he was speaking to John the Baptist. And he says something. He says, He arrived from Galilee in 3 13 at the Jordan coming to John to be baptized by him and he tried to prevent him saying no I need to be baptized by you he's pulled a Peter on him right he's like no if you don't I want I will never let you wash me no he says I need to be baptized by you and you come to me and Yeshua answered saying permit it at this time for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness and so I want to talk about this righteousness because there's a misunderstanding, there's a lot of misunderstandings about this text. And in this text, we have denominations, we have denominations who say, unless you're baptized, you're not going to heaven. And so I ask when you're going into, uh, when you're about to die, is it the only requirement that you can die and then you don't have to be baptized? Because that's the only requirement that gets you into heaven is that no baptism in water. But the word righteousness here is we have to understand what fulfill righteousness means. It doesn't mean to fulfill righteousness or you're not going to heaven. I'm going to explain it to you a little better. Fulfilling righteousness in our flesh, we have always deemed it in our mind to be acts. We have to perform something, right? We have to perform something. Well, then the word of God is a lie. If you have to perform something to fulfill righteousness, the word of God is a lie. Because it said Abraham believed and it was counted to him righteous. He didn't do anything physically. So if you look at this verse, you cannot translate it. You have to be baptized so that you can get to heaven. It's, that's not what it's saying. But to fulfill righteousness, there was something to be done with the fleshly man. Now remember, if you go all the way back to the Unknown Sanctuary Part 1, and you walk all the way through it, you're going to see how corrupt this body is, and this flesh is. And the one thing that the water was doing was to expose your idolatry. To give up your idolatry, and that God be one in you. Right? So if this flesh were eating of this tree of knowledge was going to have to lay down who he was, then righteousness here doesn't mean it's an act. Righteousness here means an exchange. When Abraham exchanged who he was, what happened in Abraham's life? He left his father's house for God's plan. That's what he did. So when Yeshua presented himself to John, he was saying, about this flesh here, I have to make an announcement. Because the spirit was going to come to dwell in the flesh. Or the spirit doesn't dwell in the flesh, right? It doesn't dwell in the flesh. You can't lay hands on the sick and they recover. They do, right? Okay. When you speak tongues, is it you speaking or you close your mouth and it comes out of nowhere? It comes out of you, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. What about when uh, you have visions and dreams? Is it an out-of-body experience? It's not you? It's not your mind that he's using? Okay, so this vessel that we're in, the, the, the Holy Spirit has to come into. Is that right? So if you believe in the baptism of the Spirit, which there are denominations who do not believe what I'm telling you, they believe once you're saved, you're fully filled with the Spirit to the limit that He's going to give it to you. I have been told that. I have been told that I was wrong. You are wrong. You're fully filled. And I say, show me. And they can't. 
They just read this scripture and say, you must be born again. And I say, well, explain it to me. Well, then you, re you receive Jesus and the, you get baptized and the Holy Spirit's in you. And that's it. I'm not the only one that had been told that. My husband went to seminary. And I believe at a certain time he might have believed it too. That you're fully filled with the Spirit at, at salvation. But there is an encounter that happens on the flesh when the Spirit of God comes to live in you. And I only testify of it because it had to happen to me. I couldn't testify it without it happening to me. I could never tell you what I tell you today if I hadn't received the Spirit that way. Because I lived with my parents and I was raised in the belief that there is one God, that there is His Son and there is a Spirit and that I must be born again and I must be Spirit-filled. And I saw it and I desired, but I can promise you I wasn't Spirit-filled until the day I knew, absolutely knew, and conviction began to set in. Yeah, I was convicted here and there because the Spirit was around. He, never, he didn't leave me. He knew that I, there was opportunity for me. But I can promise you that in here, there was corruptness. Here I go with a ness. Corruption. Probably not even a word. Corruption. Thank you. I love ness. Just adding ness to anything. It's horrible. Awesomeness. And so... The Spirit transformed me, and I testify to you that unless it was a physical transformation in me, there was not going to be the outpouring of the kingdom of God through me. I'll tell you this much. One day I was very desperate, and I may have shared this story. I, I, I repeat myself a lot. One day I was very desperate because my husband can go up to any person on the street. Maybe I'm exaggerating. But he can go up to any person on the street, and he could just love on them and talk to them and they would immediately want to receive Christ. Like that. Mm -hmm. Just like that. He still does it. Mm -hmm. And so I would see him, we're driving, talking, and he'd be like, hold on. He'd turn around, he'd go buy something to eat, he'd walk down the street, he'd talk to them. All of a sudden they're crying, hugging them, he's hugging them back, giving their life to the Lord. And then he'd leave and he's like, all right. And I'm looking, I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> And so one day I was explained that I didn't have the gift of salvation. And I looked and I said, I don't see that gift in here. Well, you just need the gift to save people. I said, no, it's not in here. Can you show me where that is? Well, no, no, it's just known by every believer. And I said, I think you're lying. There's no gift in here for salvation. Yes, a soul winner. I'm like, show it to me. Can anybody tell me where it is? There's no such gift of the Spirit. It says that we should all strive to make disciples of men. So I said, if that's there, it's mine. Okay, claim it, receive it, and move in it. What a lie. So one day a woman was passing by the church, and she came and knocked, and she says, I'm hungry, I don't have food, I need this. And I looked, and I said, here's my chance. So I went over, Sam remembers this. Oh, so embarrassing. And I went and I said, come on in, come on in. We received her. And I'm like, all right, here it comes. All right, all right, let's do this. And so she comes in. We have some meat in the fridge and some food that we usually used to keep in the church to give out and stuff. And so we, you know, give her stuff. And she said, I just want some bus fare because, you know, I need to get from here to there. And, you know, and Sam's like, and all the youth were there. We were having a car wash. Do you remember this, Sam? We we're having a car wash. And so I'm there like, okay, this is going to be active, it's active, right? So we're standing there and, and I'm waiting because I know Sam can make her fall to her knees, you know, and give her life and everything else to the Lord. And I'm standing there and it's like the Lord knew. And he's like, Jamie, would you like to pray for her? And I looked and I'm like, yes, I would. And so I look at her and I'm like, first of all, have you received the Lord as your Lord and Savior? She said, no. I said, would you like to do that right now? She said, no. I said, but you know, I told her all about the Lord. Oh, he's so good, and he healed me, and he this and that. And she was saying, she said, oh, it's nice, that's good, I'm so happy for you. I said, don't you want to receive the Lord? She said, no. <laughs> I said, this, this gift's not working. <laughs> I claimed it, I received it, I can move in it. What happened? 
I started getting desperate. Do you know what I did? I said, would you just say yes so I could just feel better? <laughs> Do you remember now, Sam? I said, would you just say yes? Sam had to stop me. I was like, please, just say yes because you're making me feel bad. <laughs> I promise I did that. It was a shameful day. <laughs> And I went home and I cried and I cried. Didn't the lady see all the mercy of God? Why didn't the lady? And Sam's like, oh, okay. And I started to think there must be a gift because I don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> there must be. So I started looking through the word. And the Lord says, there's no gift. There's something wrong with you. Now I can walk up to and people, my niece has been with me, and my nephew, my son, everybody, and I just walk up to somebody, they melt, they fall, they give their life to the Lord, and it's over. And I look and I'm like, there was something wrong in me. It was me. It was me. It wasn't them. It was me. And so how do you reproduce if you haven't become the product? How do you reproduce if you haven't become the product? Yeah, and I was, we were already married maybe a year. Maybe it was the same year we got married. Because I remember when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, whoa. Whoa. There was a change in my life. And so, to fulfill righteousness, this is not about you getting dunked in water into salvation. To fulfill righteousness means this body, this earthly body, has its roots, has its, its ways in the earth system. And in order for you to be born again, you've got to come out of the world system and behold the kingdom of God. Behold the kingdom of God. Be rid of the world system. John 6, 63. Let's go to John 6, 63. I'm having a hard time keeping to my notes, so that's a good sign. In John 6, 63, let's start with 59. It says, These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a difficult statement. Remember, he was saying, this is where he was saying uh, about his flesh and his blood. This is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Yeshua, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, Does this cause you to stumble? What then if you should behold the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. So what is he saying here about the ascension? He says, do you have to literally see me go up into heaven? Or was he saying, you are going to see me go up into heaven. What is that going to cause your spirit to do? Rise up? If you don't exchange your spirit, your flesh for your spirit, you're not going to understand why I'm going up. Your flesh is going to get puffed up. Well, my master, he went up in bodily form. Therefore, we're better than you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? They were going to see him and others were going to see him go up. He says, if you don't exchange this flesh for the spirit, you're not going to understand why I'm going up. You're going to get haughty. You're going to get prideful. You're going to fall. Because spiritual things are seen by the spirit. And fleshly things are seen by the flesh. And you're still flesh. Therefore, when I spoke and said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you thought I was being literal. You thought that when I put the blood, there's still doctrines that believe they're eating the flesh and drinking the blood when they have communion. <laughs> What is really happening here? He says, unless you open your eyes to the Spirit, I don't care how many times you dunk yourself in water. I don't, tear, I don't care how many times you eat communion. None of it's going to matter because all you're going to do is exalt your flesh. Your flesh is going to be worse instead of better. Why? Because what brings the Spirit? The denying of the flesh. Yes. 
He says, when you see me go up, you have to be ready to see with spiritual eyes. What did the angels say when they were standing there looking at the men? They should have said, you idiots, you dumb men. They didn't. They said, what are you still standing here looking up? Didn't he give you a commission? You should run. He said, the same one that went up is going to come down in the same way. See? In the same cloud. In a cloud. He's coming back in a cloud. I believe it. Because that is what he said. I don't have to try to understand the chemistry of a cloud. I just have to understand that he said he was coming in the same way. I don't care if you can fall through a cloud, fly through a cloud, jump through a cloud. I don't care. Peter Pan stood on a cloud. No, I'm kidding. It's a, it's a joke. Jesus can't. Peter Pan can't. Of course not. Jesus came up with the Peter Pan concept. I'm, I'm just saying. Peter Pan stole it. <laughs> what, is, what is life without humor, people? I love to laugh. <laughs> oh, I want you to understand what I'm saying. He says, if you can't see with spiritual eyes, when the flesh comes a knocking, you're going to get puffed up. There's no kingdom here. When you go lay hands on the sick and they recover, you're going to think it's you. When the faith of that person made them heal, you're going to lay hands and take the credit for yourself. Sometimes I don't lay hands on nobody. When I see in a place where I go minister, that, it's caught, that there's a lot of children, that there are immature people who can't see the flesh from the spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't lay hands on anybody, and the Lord still does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Sister, lay hands on me. I don't want to lay hands on you. Yes, I act like that. Sometimes I've been told I'm a little hard. But literally, I say five, four, three, two, one. Still happens. I can see the spirit moving. Why? You have to have eyes to see. He says, don't touch them, lest they lift you up. Don't touch them. They're babies. They're children, they can't see. You have to understand, it is the spirit that quickens. It is the spirit that quickens. What does it mean to be quickened? What does it mean to be quickened? It is the spirit. Lord, I know it's your spirit, quicken me. What does it mean? It gives me life. It gives me the true life. The Spirit, He gives you true life. Not this life. The flesh is denied when the Spirit comes. And the flesh will profit none of it. Because the Spirit of God relates only to that of eternity, not the flesh. The flesh falls to the ground. And the spirit remains forever. So when the flesh is at work, then all things are temporary. But when the spirit is at work, then all things are eternal. Now, which would you rather be? Eternal or temporary? Then make your flesh temporary so that your spirit can abound in eternity. And all will see the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done, means you're going to actively work in this kingdom where they will see eternal demonstrations. Only that which is from heaven, which comes through supernatural healing, creative healing, supernatural moves of God, can come from the Spirit who is eternal, not your flesh. I guarantee you, the works of the flesh would be demonstrated by witchcraft. They are temporary compared to God's. They are temporary. So what, what is the soul? Now let's look at the soul again. If we're fighting against the flesh, we're fighting against nefesh. We're fighting against our own will. We are fighting against our own will. We are putting it in a place in order that our spirit be led by the spirit and our flesh become nothing. 
We're going to get deeper. Let's go to Matthew 4. Then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. After what? After what? Being baptized. After being baptized. Matthew chapter 4. See, right before this, we look and it says, after he was baptized in, in 13, 16, it says, immediately, when he went up immediately from the water, the heavens were open. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. Right? So what did he descend upon? The flesh of Yeshua. He descended upon the flesh of Yeshua. It doesn't say that the dove came down and entered into the flesh. It said he came upon the flesh of Yeshua. He descended and fell upon him immediately. So you have Yeshua coming up from the water, the heavens opening, and the dove descending. So what happens when the dove descends? It says, a voice out of the heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In other verses it says, this is my son whom I've begotten. What did we say begotten was? Begotten. Oh. To? Behold. No. Proclaimed as when you are met. This is my son whom I have called. What happens in the, when you lay down the flesh realm? What happens when you lay down the flesh to fulfill righteousness? You, lay in that, you have to lay down the flesh to fulfill righteousness. The flesh has to become nothing. The spirit has to be yielded to God. And then God calls you. Right here, God identified begotten. He identifies and he says, now go. What happens after this? Yeshua's ministry propels. Do you see that? Yes. We have to see the pattern in the greatest servant of all. Yeshua. When the spirit came and he laid down his flesh like all of us have to, the pattern is right here in front of us. Then God said, I can call you now. Now you can go fulfill. This is Yeshua. This is the greatest example we have. There's many, many more examples. But he was very intricate, very uh, detailed on how it works. You have to understand. You have to grab it. He says, now your calling begins. Well, Yeshua was the Son of God, conceived of the Holy Spirit. What do you mean? What do you mean, Jamie? No way. We just don't know about his first 33 years. I mean, his first 30 years. That's all. He must have done great things. Show me. <laughs> Show me where he did those great things. I guarantee you that it made him king. But I have volumes of books that say no one believed in him. They thought he was going to become nothing. Yep. They thought he was going to become nothing. Until the day he said, it's time. And he said, I know what, exactly what to do. Do you think that his flesh needed schooling too? Mm -hmm. Only the schooling of God. When the law and the prophets showed up to him, do you think that was the first time? Do you think that Moses and Elijah didn't frequent? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeshua knew that he came from up, up with God. He says, if you knew the things I left to come here, but if you only knew what I was going back to, you wouldn't hold me down. You have to understand, he, he had knowledge. There was a, 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 a rabbi from one of Bethlehem. And he wrote, they went to go investigate when the shepherds heard the singing of angels in the midst of Bethlehem. And they said the, the nighttime turned to daylight at the birth of Yeshua. There was no night when Yeshua came into the earth. 
at the birth of Yeshua, it turned to light. Mm -hmm. They said it was so bright, they thought it was daytime in the middle of the night when he was born. Mm -hmm. And what, what happens? He says, the Messiah is born. He knew. Mm -hmm. He says, somewhere the Messiah is born. It is prophesied this was going to happen. He knew his word. What happened? Then it came back to darkness. And he had to live a fleshly life like you and me. But then this rabbi said that they would bring Yeshua. And he would gather with this rabbi to speak and that his wisdom was far above anyone else's. And yet he never went into a public school. No yeshiva. How did this man know these things? Oh, he was a son of God. No. How did he know these things? Because he knew where he came from. He was a living word and he couldn't deny it. And in him was a living word, but on the exterior, he bled and he died for you and me. Why did he have to go to the cross? Why? If you want to call it a stake, call it a stake. Why did he have to go and bleed and die if he was the son of God? Because you and me had a corrupt flesh. Amen. And he presented himself holy unto the Lord to give you the opportunity to be baptized with God's Holy Spirit. Amen. That is the first fruit that I'm excited about. Amen. That is the first fruit. So he, after being baptized, this happens and it says, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was tempted! He was led by the Spirit. You think your temptations come from, you, from what? What do they come from? To be led by the Spirit. To be tempted by the devil? Yes, and he said, you ain't going to eat for 40 days. How many of you have listened to the Spirit? About three days later, you're like, I think I heard the Spirit say for me to stop. <laughs> I really, really, really think I heard him say stop. This is not for me. Yeshua did it. I don't have to do it. Oh, praise you, God. <laughs> oh, come on. I've been there. I mean, crying out, Lord, I can't do 40 days. He's like, I know you're so weak. Deny the flesh, Jamie. And I'm like, oh, but it's like this one's eating this one. And it's like there's a fight inside of me. Esau and Jacob were there again. That's what I named my large intestine and my small intestine. <laughs> but the spirit led him and he followed the spirit too. And he knew because he knew how to search the mind of God. And he said, I got to do this. And he went in. It's only when obedience at whatever cost it is to lay down your life comes that you'll then be led by the Spirit. The cost of obedience is high. The price is so high because it costs you, you. You want to know what it costs? You. That's what it costs. You like you, you won't be led by the Spirit. Maybe you'll be led here and there, but you're not going to be fully led by the Spirit unless you are gone. At this point, Yeshua became the greatest man on earth. People began to follow Him. But yet Yeshua Himself, He could have puffed up too. He could have been a second fallen Adam. This time, conceived of the Holy Spirit. Well, what do you think Adam was conceived of? Have you thought about it? Mm -hmm. Nobody, there's no conception of Adam. Yeah, he's called the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. He's the one who conceives. Mm -hmm. He's the one who conceives. Yeshua could have done the same thing. He could have done the same exact thing. He was led, he was tempted. Now let's go over to John 14. In John 14, Yeshua is talking to his disciples and he, he starts to explain to them the work of the Spirit. And I like 16. Let me see if I don't jump over.
In John 14, 16, it says this. He's speaking. He comforts his disciples. He said, let not your heart be troubled. He speaks about oneness. I and the Father are one. He speaks to Philip and he says, Philip, you know, I've been with you so long, yet you have not known me. His representation fully was the Father's representation. He had traded in his flesh for the fullness of the Spirit. And the fullness of the Spirit was, demonstrates the Father and testifies of the Son. Now, now listen to me again. The fullness of the Spirit demonstrates the Father and it, He testifies of the Son. That's the two main things that the Spirit does. He is going to, the obedience is to the Father. You have to understand the Holy Spirit's obedience. Just like your Spirit's obedience is to you, the Holy Spirit's obedience is to the Father. And when, he, when He's in the obedience of the Father, to show the obedience of the Father, right? To bring you into that obedience, He testifies about Yeshua. And that is the role of the Spirit in a nutshell. That's the role of the Spirit. He will never go ahead of Yeshua. Never, never, never. He's never going to go ahead of Yeshua. Being the Spirit of the Father, you would think He had more authority than, than Yeshua, right? Think about it. Who would have more authority? But because of the obedience of Yeshua to the Father, now the Spirit must testify of that obedience because that's His first role. The obedience to the Father. And if his first role is obedience to the Father, as he glorifies the Son, he reveals how you could be obedient to the Father. Yes. This is how important the Spirit is. This is how important he is. He says, and I will ask, 14, 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Remember, this is what happened at Shavuot. That he may be with you forever. How long? Forever! That is the spirit of truth. Listen, where does truth come from? The spirit. You ever want to give the truth? You need the spirit. You need the spirit whom the world cannot receive. Uh-oh. So if your flesh is abiding in world system, can you receive them? Let's not talk about the outside world. Let's not think about your neighbor's friends and co-workers who you think are heathen. I'm talking about you. You, if the world is in you, can you receive him? No. Because it does not, what? Behold him. What were we talking about beholding the kingdom? Seeing. Remember, what was the word? Being mindful, purposeful. You cannot see the kingdom without the Spirit. If you're in a worldly system and not in a kingdom system, you cannot, what? Behold Him. It does not behold Him or it does not behold you. It's not in you or known or know Him, right? But you know Him because he abides with you and will be in you. So now we know he abides here. This is his abode. The Lord, the Father has sent him to the world, just like he did at the beginning, to have his abode on earth. Pretty simple. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And the Spirit of God hovered over the firmament of the waters. Right? Mm -hmm. So he was sent. So is that anything new? No. So Yeshua goes up and he says, Father, I did it. Here I am. Completely man. I present myself to you knowing that man can be trusted with your spirit. His work was so many different manifolds. So many. It was manifold. One of his jobs was to win the fight that Adam lost. To present himself to God so that God can trust you with his spirit. So when the spirit came down like fire that day, 
God was pleased that he could impart his spirit. Not because of anything you did, but because of what Yeshua did. It's Yeshua. Amen. It's Him. Mm -hmm. How grateful are you? Amen. How grateful. Mm -hmm. You didn't do anything. But He's asking you to do something. Mm -hmm. He's asking you to take care of what God has entrusted you with. He's saying, lay down your life. It's not worth it. The, this world's going to fade away. And if you keep a hold of it, you'll fade away. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And I give you his spirit to be with you forever. Forever. He abides with you and will be in you. He was telling his disciples when he comes, he needs an abode. He needs an earthly tabernacle. Right now he's in me. But then he'll be in all of you. Omnipresent. He'll be in all of you. How is that possible? Only God knows. <coughs> I'll not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will behold me no more. But you will behold me. Because I live, you shall live. Mm -hmm. So in, when he began to speak of the Father and him being one, he was saying the similitude that's in me as I laid my own flesh down, you see the Father. You will see Him. I represent Him. So He's telling you that when the Spirit comes to live inside of you, you represent Yeshua. Why do you think He said, as I was telling Sister earlier, ask anything in my name, and the it will be given to you by the Father? Was He literally saying, just ask in right now, and the only thing that you have got to do is sit at the feet of the Spirit to learn all about your bridegroom. See, that's how, when you're intimate, we started with intimacy, and we said, look, when we get married, we conceive. The marriage is for conception. No longer in the world are they thinking this way. But marriage at one time was about conception, reproduction, because it's a holy and sanctified thing that God ordained. Not only because it's this way, but because it was this way from the beginning. And so what, when we think about it and we think of denying the purposes of God, the world's going to manifest that which denies the purpose of God. It's, gonna, it's going to manifest it physically in order for you to manifest it spiritually. Because there's an effect. There's an effect. There's a spiritual application, but there's a physical manifestation. The kingdom of God doesn't have to remain spiritual. It needs to manifest to change the world from its physical state of errancy to its spiritual state of eternity. You have to realize what you're doing when you say yes to the kingdom of God. You're not saying yes to get away from the world. You're saying yes to transform the world. That's what you're saying when you say yes. You're not saying yes to go and hide. You're saying yes out loud. You're saying yes. But are you living out loud? Are you living out loud? Because when Yeshua was told to fulfill all righteousness, this flesh has to be denied. He went himself. He knew the work of John the, the Immerser. And he went to him and he said, I will do like you will do to fulfill all righteousness, publicly declare the name of God, that he is one. Then what happened? Then the Spirit could lead him. Then and then only can the Spirit lead him. You have to see the work. Don't lie to yourself that Yeshua was so godly and holy and above all things that all he did it for was something else. He wasn't doing it because of me. No, he did it because of you. Amen. He did it because of you to show you and prove to you that you also can show yourself blameless before God. Yes, you can. Sin must decrease for eternity in you to increase. And let me tell you, it's all wrapped up in your soulless realm. Some of you are going to be surprised when we get into 
1 Corinthians 12 to find out some of the things that you're holding on to that are denying the kingdom of God to this world. You're denying the kingdom of God to this world. And it's all wrapped up in your flesh. It's all wrapped up in your flesh. How do I know? God had to prove it in me. I'm not going to lie to you. I've told you what ugly person I thought I was. Now you're probably like, no. Even my mom's like, no, you've never been that. You don't know the ugly thoughts and intents of my heart. Amen. Only he does. You don't know. Let's keep on going. Yeshua could have bowed down to the flesh, desires having a human body with soul, because he was as much flesh as he was God. He could have. That's the truth. Let's go, uh, let's go see this pattern. I want to show you one of his disciples in Matthew 26. I want to show you what I mean when he spoke to his disciples. In, we know it as Peter's denial, right? It's pretty famous. And we're like, we're not going to deny him. I don't know. Some of you deny him every day just because you won't bow down to his will. It's amazing how much we want him to bow down to our will. Matthew 26, uh, 20, 26, 28. The Lord is at the last Passover that he was going to be with his disciples. He goes all the way down. And he starts to talk to them about the last time he'll be drinking this cup. He says, this is the last time until, you know, I'm with you in the kingdom. You know, he's, he speaks and uh, let's go to 28. Let's see if that's where I am. In 29, in 28, he says, And when he had taken the cup, in 27, and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I say to you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now, many people say, Yeshua, that's the cup that nobody touches because we're not in his kingdom. This whole recording you can throw away then. Because we just talked about his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Put the drawbridge down and come out of your castle. The kingdom is at hand. Mm -hmm. When is this cup of the covenant accepted? When you decide the kingdom is now. Mm -hmm. this is what he's saying he's saying unless you understand that you want to walk in the kingdom and you propel yourself into the kingdom by saying I lay down my life to take on your spirit being led by you then the kingdom of God is never I will never have covenant with you mm -hmm. my covenant is to restore the earth and you're the measure by which God has given me to restore. Mm -hmm. Oh, what little men we are. Small in mind to think that there's a cup left on the table. I see people leaving the whole cup and not drinking the last cup. Mm -hmm. Because Yeshua is not here yet. And he's going to drink it with us when he comes back. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I've seen it. They put it down. No, we can't drink the last cup. We can't drink the last cup because that's Yeshua's cup. I want to read it to you and ask, you ask right now, Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Open my eyes as I read it again. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. What is he saying? He's saying, unless the kingdom becomes real in you, I cannot share this covenant with you. This is the covenant to repair the world. That's the covenant. We can go back to covenant if you want to, but it's going to be a pretty long teaching. The covenant. 
If you know what the covenant means already, and he's telling you, if you don't accept my covenant to repair the world, you know what? You know why the world is in this, this position? Because we're letting it. Mm -hmm. We're letting it. There have been very few men of God who were able to transcend through the, the darkness, the thickness, the error of this world. And we've criticized them when they're dead. We've talked about them and said they weren't good enough. They died in sin. They this, they that. But I tell you the truth, they did more than what you're doing sitting here. They did, they did more. We love to talk about everybody else but ourselves. I want that cup. I've seen that cup. He imparts his covenant with others because I say yes. I say yes. Let's do this, Lord. I don't care what kind of embarrassment people think I'm going to go through. I don't, think, I don't care about what my flesh thinks it's about, to, it's about to encounter. It's not worth it. To die is gain. Do you understand why Paul said that now? To live is who? Yeshua. Do you understand that verse? To live is? To live is? To live is? Until you can make your body understand that in your flesh. To live is Yeshua. To live is my Messiah. And then to die? Oh, it's gain. Because you're, you're not killing me. You're killing the kingdom in me. He said, you're going to, see, they're going to kill you because of my name's sake. But persevere. Persevere. Because somebody else, until we multiply to the place where this government, the government of this world is the government of our God. Until we multiply and we push forward, we are always going to see destruction. We're always going to see the things, darkness, overtake this world until you rise up already and say, okay, I've had it. How do we do it, Lord? To live is? Yeshua. Yeshua. Not you. Not, not your name. Don't put your name in there. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's His name. What does the Holy Spirit testify of? Obedience to? The Father. Father. And then? Testimony of? Yeshua. And if the Spirit's in you, you will, you will demonstrate the obedience to the? And you will testify of? Not you. You know how many times your testimony means nothing to people? They cry because they, oh my gosh, you were a drunk. Me too. Oh my God, really? You were, yeah. were you an alcoholic too? Oh, praise Yeshua, yes, I know, we're both saved. Your testimony is not going to make a difference except for tears in the eyes. His testimony. His testimony. You open your mouth about Yeshua, His testimony. His testimony. Our testimony, it just brings tears to people's eyes. They don't want to be like you. They have their own character. They have their own way. You have to want to be like Him. And you have to want to be like Him. You have to. Oh, I hope I get through this. John chapter 18, 25. Actually, yes. Let's keep on with Matthew. I want to show you something. <clears throat> So we keep on reading. They come out. Uh, he says this, and then 30, we're in 30. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Yeshua said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. You know, when I was reading this, I said, Lord, reveal this to me, because I think this is very significant and people don't understand it. So I want to take you to this prophetic word in, in Zechariah. I want to take you to this word. And in Zechariah 14, uh, 13, I'm sorry. In Zechariah chapter 13, I went to Zechariah and began to read. And the topics here, uh, one of the topics in 11 is that the flock was doomed. 
the flock of the sheep was doomed. There was no hope for the flock. And the second one was that Jerusalem was going to be attacked. And so I began to look and I began to ask the Spirit for his eyes to see what, why this was put in this way. And the Spirit of God said, it's very easy. These words are cut up and placed in different ways. You can't read them chronologically. They don't work. And so I said, okay. So I went to 13. <clears throat> and it's actually in 13, we start with the return of Messiah. So as you read the beginning, I'm going to tell you when it transits. It's almost like John and Yeshua when we were talking about them, how the scriptures are going back and forth about him and then Yeshua and then him and Yeshua. And so in Zechariah, he has a vision of the time after Messiah's death. All right. Um, before the coming of, before, uh, let me start again. Zechariah has a vision of the time after Messiah's death. Okay. And before the coming of the false prophets. Now there was, he was going to prophesy the coming of false prophets after a certain time. All right. So this is here is about timing. Every vision has timing. You have to remember that. Every vision. Remember, we're very much in the prophets because we have to understand how it testifies of Yeshua and how it testifies of the future. And so I want to help you understand that as Zechariah speaks, there will be a time coming of no prophecy or false prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to hear me real good because you're going to start to recognize what time it is. Are you ready? In that day, mark that, in that day. All right, that's very important. It's a now word. In that day. 13, Zechariah chapter 13. It's very hard to find Zechariah. It's right before Malachi. So if you go back from Malachi, you'll find Zechariah. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David. And for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For sin and for impurity. Are you listening? Fountain. What is fountain? What flows out of fountains? Water. Right? He says a fountain will be opened for the house of David. Right? For the kingship. Right? For the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For what? Sin and impurity. So we're, he's, the, he's identifying the work of? John the Baptist. Wow. Are you noticing? Okay. So a fountain is open for sin and impurity. Now we're talking about the washing, right? All right. It says, and it will come about in what day? That day. All right. So now we're still on the same day. Declares the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. Well, isn't that what washing, right? The water baptism is about yeah. cutting off of the idolatry in our lives. And they will no longer be remembered. I will also remove the prophets. Listen. And the unclean spirit from the land. So there is a regional stronghold, a spirit in that land. He says, I'm going to cut off that which is being prophesied because it's false. At that time, I will cut off the spirit of prophecy that is a lie. At that time. He says, it will come about that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who gave birth to him will say to him, you shall not live, for you have spoken falsely in the name of the Lord, which is a command. It's actually a command if you go back to the commandments of the Lord at the beginning of the Bible. And his father and mother who gave birth to him will pierce him through when he prophesies. Also, it will come about in that day, there's another that day, that the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies and they will not put on a hairy robe in order to deceive. They will not disguise themselves. They will be ashamed of their visions. In other words, who's giving them these visions? The contrary spirit, the unclean spirit that was in the region. There's an unclean spirit giving them these visions, right? So let me tell you, can a prophet prophesy by the anointing of a spirit other than God. Yes, this says it right here. You have to be careful because human spirits 
cause prophets to prophesy. So, I want you to understand, they're, 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 they're ashamed of their, of their prophecies, but yet, they won't stop. And God has taken His Spirit. He won't, he won't let them prophesy, right? He says, but He will say, I am not a prophet. I am a tiller of the ground, for a man sold me as a slave in my youth. Okay, so he's saying, he, uh, he will say, I am not a prophet, I am a tiller of the ground. Now let's remember what happened at the very beginning when man had to be a tiller of the ground. What was God asking for? He was asking for worship. He was asking for ebed. He was asking for worship. Um, a prophet has to return, release the calling upon his life, and become a worshiper before God can use him again. When a prophet miss it decides to prophesy, not misprophesize, but decides to prophesy out of the will of human nature or out of the will, God will take him back down to become a worshiper before he exalts him again. I promise you, that calling looks destroyed. When I was in disobedience to God, I cried all night. I had nights when I cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. And I was, I was working at a church. I was doing evangelism. We were doing all these things. But God had called me to be what I was. And at me denying my calling, God returned me back to be a full worshiper before he released me in my calling again. Mm -hmm. He had to return me back. And most of you, even though you're an evangelist, you're a pastor, you're this, that, he's doing that with you right now. He's returning you to be a tiller of the ground before he exalts you again. He can't give you your calling and push you out without you in the fullness of the Spirit doing it. You can't, you got to learn, you want to lay down your life, you got to learn how to be a worshiper first. Being a worshiper doesn't mean you're laying down your life. It's a process of laying down your life. Returning to worship. We'll talk about worship. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? Now, what is this time? Then he will say, those that which, which with I was wounded in the house of my friends. So at this time, Yeshua is showing his wounds. And they're saying, what are these wounds you have? And he's saying, that which which I was wounded in the house of my friends. What is he saying? What time is it? The return of the Messiah. These things will happen, this false prophecy will happen before the return of the Messiah. Listen, this is timing. Let's keep on reading so that way you can see with, see with better eyes. <coughs> right after that, in number seven, he says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man, my associate. Declare the Lord of hosts, declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered and I will return, I will turn my hand against the little ones. Here he's saying, right now, he told them, they're going to strike me and you're going to be scattered. He speaks this prophecy. Mm -hmm. He speaks the prophecy. He says, this is going to happen. So before he returns, we're going to see an apostate prophetic move like you've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. Until he stops it himself. Till he puts a stop himself. Then your Messiah returns. And here's what, here's the magnificence of this. Listen, listen real close. It says, and it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it, a remnant, right? I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name. I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say, Yehovah is my God. So 
at the time, he's saying, the reason I scatter you is to gather them all. But they will be tried with fire. What does fire do to your flesh? Mm. To what? Fire destroys your flesh. Mm -hmm. Pulverizes you. Mm -hmm. He says, and I want that for you. Can you imagine God? I want that for you. I don't want to be, I don't want to let any more flesh contaminate this earth. So I'm giving you my spirit. I am giving you my spirit. Let's go back to John 3. See, this false prophecy is trying to take you away. It's trying to take you away. And some of you, it's, it's succeeding. There are some among you that, it, that the false prophecy is succeeding. And we have got to understand that it is here and that Yeshua is almost, almost here. And He wants to refine you. He wants you to be led by the Spirit. Maybe you've casted your idols down. Maybe you've said yes to the baptism of water unto righteousness. But are you being led by the Spirit? John 3 says, That which is born. What is born again? Born is Hashav, which means that which is mindful or purposed after. It doesn't mean that which is mindful. Okay, the Spirit's there. I'm here. That's, I'm mindful of you. He says, that which is mindful or purposed after. That which allows the Spirit's purpose to go through you. To manifest through you. That which is mindful or purposed after. The flesh is flesh. If you're going to be purpose and mindful after the flesh, you're going to do everything according to your likeness. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is what? Mindful or purposed after the spirit is spirit. God is spirit. And he seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth, not in flesh. Well, how am I supposed to destroy my flesh? You're making it so hard for me, Jamie. I'm just flesh. Okay, you stay flesh. I'm going after the spirit. You stay flesh. I'm going after the spirit. And don't tell me when you don't see the works of God through, you, the, the, through the demonstrations that you don't have. Don't look at me and call me and want me to work my demonstrations because you can't do it. You know how irritating that is? Don't do that. Start being spirit-led. And do the works of God. Do not be amazed that I said it to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. But, do not, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Why? Because you can't hear with your natural ears when someone speaks. You only feel the vibrations. This is how you know I'm speaking. Because you hear the vibrations. You can't hear anything. Really, you hear vibrations. That's how your ear hears. So the spirit is so sensitive, when he moves, you stop. When he speaks, you shut up. When, you, when, you, when you, he's in movement, you've got to know that he's like the wind. He's going to show up when he feels that he needs to, and he's going to go when he feels like he needs to. And you've got to be ready for him. You've got to be ready for his acts. You've got to be ready to say, move and I will follow you. Don't make him run after you, because he won't. He didn't run after Yeshua, he ain't running after you. His job is obedience to the Father. And he testifies of Yeshua. What is your job? Your job is now to say, 
the Spirit and I, we're one. Mm -hmm. Because in the Spirit, you have an obedience to the Father. And you testify of Yeshua. How many of you want to? How many of you want to? Before we learn what it is we are called and what our mission is, we must understand the workings of the living stones. The inner workings of the living stones that we are. You want obedience to God? You can't do it. Because you take the part of the law that you like and you forget the parts you don't. But the law of the Lord is perfect. And it is demonstrated through His Spirit. It is manifested through His Son. And He wants you, you, to demonstrate the kingdom that carries this law. He wants you with all his heart for you to demonstrate the kingdom of God. How many